Arm7DX is billed as a mecha shooting game, a description which may have made some fans of traditional shmups, including me, wonder whether the game would be for them or not. However, fear not, because despite the fact that you are indeed piloting a giant armed mech, Arm7 is about as straight-laced and uncomplicated a shmup as they come, and I mean that in the absolute best sense. At the start of each game, you have multiple options for setting up your mech, and must choose one of four different weapons for each of the three available slots, with each choice also affecting the speed at which your biggest weapon's energy bar will charge. But despite seeming like a lot to consider at the start of your very first play, these are actually easy, intuitive options you'll come to terms with after just a couple of goals, and rather than fostering any sort of confusion, they have the positive effect of offering the opportunity for experimentation, and therefore adding some decent replayability into the mix. Once you have your mech set up, off you blast and it is straight into the fray, just like it should be, with a host of fighter jets, rockets and enemy mechs gunning right for you from the word go. Despite having three weapons, you only have two buttons to worry about, as your primary and secondary weapons fire simultaneously using the main shot button. Your primary weapon also has three angles of fire, straight, tilted up or tilted down, and can be easily adjusted as you move, then locked into place when you hold down fire. Honestly, this doesn't add as much as you might think, and while it does offer up something a little bit different to think about, most of the time you won't be thinking about this aspect too much. Your third weapon requires a charge, and depending on which you selected, you could be firing off something strong-ish but localised every couple of seconds, or unleashing a super powerful enemy eviscerating beam at more sporadic intervals. Whatever you choose, however, you'll feel like a super-powered mech version of Bruce Banner's enraged and unleashed alter ego as you smash and destroy everything in sight with utter glee and reckless abandon. This even extends to bosses who, while suitably gigantic and especially on higher difficulties intimidating, are rarely not exploding somewhere, with beats and pieces falling off them as you pound them with gratifyingly endless barrages of weaponry. The health system is kind of interesting too, you start with three lives and are granted, granted and extend every million points, a number you ought to be hitting about every other stage or so. One hit knocks off one life, but periodically blue ships appear and destroying them will add to a shield stock up to a maximum of two. That means you can potentially take two hits before a third will actually reduce your life stock, and these shield ships fly in fairly regularly, so you're not going to have to be playing anywhere close to a perfect game to make progress. If you do end up stripped of your shields, however, your life stock can disappear all too quickly, and this shift of feeling from relative safety when fully shielded, to sweaty palm-inducing fear when unprotected, nicely alters the tension all through your run. This tension is increased even further by the fact the game does not offer any continues, despite seeming to do so on the game over screen. In other words, you will have to 1cc this if you want to beat it. Now I know that sounds intimidating, but fortunately it's not. On normal, a complete run, or very close to it, ought to be within most people's grasp with a bit of practice, and on easy you may find yourself facing the last boss on your first try. A stage select also heavily mitigates any potential frustration the lack of continues may cause, and with this particular game, the no continue route is a perfectly viable way to do things. Back in game, and a second ally ship, this one in red, carries shot power-ups, and both red and blue ships, if you're already maxed out on their respective cargo, will, from that point on, offer up healthy points bonuses. Further points are allocated at stage end, based on how much time you had left on the boss timer, and how many, if any, shields you finished with. One of the biggest ways of increasing your score, though, is the speed with which you dispatch larger main stage enemies, and once you've played a few games, you'll quickly start learning not just where and when enemies appear, but anticipating their arrival to launch, for example, homing missiles, which once unleashed will, if timed correctly, strike their targets the very second their little toe screeps on the screen. Overall though, while there are these odd little wrinkles to exploit, scoring essentially amounts to not getting hit and taking out as many enemies as fast as you can, which is pretty much your aim anyway. Still, at least there is a bit of meat to the scoring, something that therefore makes it all the more disappointing to find that not only are there no online leaderboards, there are no leaderboards whatsoever, with just your top score of all time being recorded next to each of the four difficulty options in the start menu. A set of collectible emblems could be considered to slightly make up for that, but the absence of a real board is undoubtedly a miss, and a somewhat strange one. 
visually the game lacks polish or wow factor, but what is here fits perfectly with the gameplay. And while the chunky mechs and simple backgrounds won't have Digital Foundry purring over whatever obscure tech term is flavour of the month right now, they do, in my opinion, look fantastic. The backgrounds in particular eliciting a feeling not dissimilar to that of viewing an impressionist painting. Yes, paused and looked at up close, they may not be all that much to write home about, but in motion and while playing they perfectly conjure up a sense of speeding over then down into a neon drenched nighttime city or blasting through fiery war torn ruins. The DX in the game's title by the way seems to mainly refer to a revised visual palette and altered soundtrack, and I do prefer the DX version to the original. Both are available from the game's menu though, so you'll be able to make your own mind up should you decide to try this. Now if visuals are a highlight, albeit I'm perfectly prepared to admit possibly something of an acquired taste, audio is the game's undoubted low light. You will find quite a few really rather unpleasant noises assaulting your ears as you play, not least of which is the one indicating your charge shot is available, which sounds more like a fire alarm whose batteries are dying than the sort of major key ping you'd expect to associate with a positive update. But nothing is quite bad enough to seriously affect your enjoyment of the game, and while audio is, as mentioned, a low light, it doesn't do much to dampen the joy of playing through this ferociously fun effort. And those two words, joy and fun, are really at the centre of everything Arm 7 is all about. No, it's not refined, it's not elegant, it's not complicated, but yes, it sure as hell is a barnstorming ride of fun, and while it may not be able to refute accusations of being somewhat basic, I don't think it really cares. It just goes to show you don't have to shoehorn in some gimmick or some overly complicated scoring system to make a great game. Sometimes you can just slap your player in a giant superpowered mech, turn them loose and watch them grin. I really enjoyed Arm 7 DX and especially at the low price, I'm happy to give it a very solid 8 out of 10 with a particular recommendation to anyone harking after a good bit of uncomplicated no heart holds barred stress relief in the midst of what remain, for many of us, some rather trying times. Do let me know your thoughts on this one, or any of the others from the Schmuck Collection this is a part of, and thank you all for watching. Hope to see you next time. Cheers.